So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Liz David Barrett. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Corruption. And I'm really pleased to have today my colleague Roxana Bratu, who is going to be talking about new technologies and corruption. So some really exciting cutting edge research. Um, she's going to talk, I think, for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we will open up to questions. So do think about what your questions are um, so that you're ready to go when we get into the question section of things. Um, if you have to leave beforehand, but you have a, a pressing question, then feel free to put it in the chat and, um, and we will uh, try to get to it and get back to you. Uh, so Roxana, I think over to you, please. Thank you very much, Liz, for the intro. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming over. What I'm going to share today is very much work in progress. So I'm relying on your minds, brilliant minds and goodwill. Um, right. Can you see my screen? You should be able to see it now. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Right, so I'm going to talk about new technologies and corruption. Well, I'm going to talk about the aims and methods of this work. I'm going to clarify the concept. I'm going to talk about practices of corruption online. I'm going to reinterpret the practices through the lens of corruption, which is um, very ambitious and a little bit far-fetched. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this um, in terms of implications for um, corruption studies. Okay, so. Aims and methods. I aim to explore what corruption in new tech looks like by focusing on existing practices. I will describe the practices and then I will sort of analyze the implications of this perspective on our current understanding of corruption. How did I do this work, which basically means the methodology? I'm very much an ethnographer, so I rely on ethnographic work. Um, it's not the classical ethnographic work in the sense of me studying uh, long term, uh, the, the online practices that relate to corruption, it's much more um, sort of an ethnography of a concept. So I, I cherry picked uh, the practices that I thought were the most um, interesting for this kind of work. And I've made a, a collection of practices and then I grouped them according to some criteria that made sense to me. Um, but I'm very open to suggestions here. Right, let's clarify our concept. Um, so there are two key concepts here that are pretty tricky. One of them is corruption. Both of them are in the title, so there is no magic here. One of them is corruption. The other one is new technologies. I'll start with the tricky one, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, that's new technologies. By new technologies, I mean web-based platforms, such as Facebook, Google, Airbnb, Booking.com, uh, Uber. These are just some examples. Now, this platforms um, create a sort of platform economy, which I see uh, almost um, in certain conditions as an extension of service economy. Um, these platforms um, are virtual um, in the sense that in some cases, not all cases, they are free floating in terms of legal jurisdictions. Um, practices that happen on these platforms are global in the sense that they transgress the geographical, the classical geographical borders. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say about these platforms is that usually when it comes to practices on these platforms, ethics takes a backseat. Um, in these platforms, um, these platforms do not own the means of production. They essentially create the means of connection. Okay. Um, the second trouble concept is corruption. Now, I've put there a few definitions of corruption, and in the end, uh, I put my take on it for the purposes of this talk. Um, I put um, TI's sort of definition of corruption, which is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain, which I think is useful for two reasons. Um, because it shows that corruption occurs both in public and private sectors. And it also shows that um, corruption occurs when actors promote different interests than the ones they were entrusted um, to serve. 
Um, the second definition that I put there from UNDP, it's quite an old definition, but I like it because it covers a wide range of behaviors, behaviors typically associated with corruption. So, and, and they explicitly say it. So it's the misuse of public power. So this definition actually positions corruption at the intersection of public and private, but focuses on the public sector. Um, public power office or authority for private benefits through bribery, extortion, influence peddling, nepotism, fraud, speed money, or embezzlement. So um, I, I think by, by showing what are the typical practices associated with corruption, we gain from this definition, we gain some further understanding. Um, but in the end, I also put Michael Johnston's definition, um, the, which looks at corruption as the behavior which deviates from the formal duties of a public role um, because it's private regarding wealth or status or which violates the rules against um, the exercise of certain types of private regarding influence. Um, again, as a political scientist, Michael Johnston is a little bit more um, comprehensive, more wider, let me put it like that. Um, but all in all, I genuinely believe with Olivier de Sardin that corruption is an umbrella term that covers a very wide range of practices. And this probably can be said also about um, other umbrella concepts such as organized crime or even fraud. Um, so why would we even talk, want to talk about corruption in relationship to new technologies? I mean, isn't the classical understanding of corruption in the so-called real world enough for us? Well, yes and no. Um, first of all, um, new technologies are a huge arena of interaction. So Stata shows that in January this year, uh, there were 4.66 billion active internet users worldwide, which basically means 60% of the global population. And out of this, um, nearly 4 billion people had at least one social media account and use it frequently. Now, take this number, uh, these numbers with a pinch of salt, because it's tricky to um, sort of quantify how many accounts one user can have and how what is an active user, if that makes sense. Um, but all in all, nearly 50% of the global population is on social media. Um, also, another thing that's very important is the lowering price of tech devices, which have dropped dramatically over the past 10 years, um, by nearly 40%. Um, also increased as access to internet, um, increased participation in online communities, and engagement with online platforms, um, economy in various ways. Now, this is very important. Um, essentially, in the past five to 10 years, we have witness, uh, witnessed um, the monetization, the increase of online platform economy. Um, and that's very important for this. So the key point that I'm trying to make is that this is a huge arena of social interaction and it's important to ask ourselves whether or not corruption exists there. And if it exists, how does it manifest? Is it the same as in the offline world? Do we, need, do we have any regulations or do we need special regulations for that? That's sort of my um, bottom line. Okay. Let's look at practices. So, as I said, I, I made a collection of practices and I grouped them according to what I think is the key thing that makes them, that, that can allow us to associate them with corruption. And that is the purpose. Um, and the purpose is the one, um, by this, I mean, these practices deviate from what they are supposed to be doing. And the purpose is to gain, gain influence, information, money, or to simply have fun. And that's, um, that's a gain in itself. So um, the typical practices associated with gaining influence are done by bots and trolls. So bots are, as you probably all know, um, software applications um, that are programmed to do certain tasks. Um, and trolls are doing the same thing, but a troll is actually a person. Um, um, that posts inflammatory, insincere, digressive, um, or off-topic messages in an online community with the purpose of provoking um, readers into displaying emotional responses. Now, when it comes to um, gaining influence, there are two types of, of um, reaction um, that are looked for via these practices. One of them is amplification. And in this category, I put fake news and deep fakes. 
Fake news, again, are no mystery for, at least for this community. These are false stories that appear to be news spread on the internet or um, using other media, usually created to influence political views or as a joke. And here is the Pizza Gate, the, the famous fake news um, scandal that was created around um, Hillary Clinton being at the heart of, a, um, of an illegal uh, child trafficking ring or something like that. Not something like that, this is it. Um, the other thing is deep fakes, which are manipulated uh, video clips using image search um, engines, social media websites, and public video footage to insert someone else's face onto pre-existing video frame, um, uh, videos frame by frame. Now, I do have a video of the um, uh, Queen's speech, um, which was deep fake is the channel for um, uh, Queen's speech. I, I don't think I'm going to play it now, even though it's really fun, but it's three minutes and I don't want to, um, to lose this three minutes, um, but I, I'm happy to share the link with you. Um, the other side of gaining influence is actually via silencing um, and other practices come into play here. One of them is um, shadow banning, uh, which basically means deliberately um, making someone's content undiscoverable to everyone except the person who posted it. Um, or um, a, a form of content ranking. Now, I should probably mention that, for example, Twitter, this is um, typical, for example, on Instagram, on Twitter. Twitter doesn't actually do shadow banning, but they do uh, rank content. Um, so one of the ranking factors that it uses is um, measurement of the tweet's intent. So if the algorithm determines that, determines that a tweet contains content that is manipulative, um, those tweets are put lower down the line. And the other form of um, gaining influence by silencing is blocking. And one of the most interesting cases of blocking is Donald Trump's uh, Twitter account, at real Donald Trump. Um, which used to block um, users that were going against uh, Donald Trump's goodwill or opinion. Um, but actually, we do have um, court ruling when it comes to, to this, basically saying, so um, essentially, Ninth First Amendment Institute um, versus Trump, Ninth First Amendment Institute filed a lawsuit in July 2017 in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, and um, basically saying that Donald Trump should not be banning uh, users on Twitter because they, if he does so, he's excluding people from the public debate, essentially arguing that Donald Trump using his private account in his official capacity was not giving the people um, the right to participate in, uh, in, in the public fora because Twitter was considered a public fora, which I think is a very interesting decision. Now, gaining information. This is another form of corruption. And I put here two cases, as far as I'm concerned. And I put here two famous cases. One of them relates to Amazon Alexa who essentially is pretty much always listening to whatever we're doing. And the other super famous case is um, Cambridge Analytica. Now, the reason for which I put these cases, uh, these two um, practices, listening, gaining information is the actual practice. These are just examples. The reason for which I put them here is because um, machine, machine learning is trained on actual data. So by doing so, tech giants, by listening, by, gaining, by getting our information, tech giants are essentially um, creating almost perfect products that they can then sell um, to um, the highest bidder. This is the argument that Shoshana Zuboff is making in her 2019 book. Um, gaining money. Um, fake listing is a practice pretty, um, quite typical for... Um, platforms such as Airbnb, booking.com or um, eBay, which basically relates to um, fake places or products that are made to look or appear real. Here I put a print screen for um, a room where from booking.com where you can actually see the things that make it um, very interesting. So there are, it's the pricing, 
the reviews and the urgency of things um, that make it tricky. Um, last but not least, um, people engaging in corrupt practices online or offline, but online in this particular case, also want to have fun. Um, catfishing, for example, is the process of luring someone into a relationship by means of fictional online persona. Catfishing is really typical for, it's a very typical practice for uh, dating platforms like Tinder, Grindr, um, you name it, uh, Bumble, um, all sorts of things. Um, sometimes people do it for um, people do it for a number of reasons, sometimes because of insecurity, sometimes for sextortion, sometimes for revenge. Um, but in principle, um, it's about um, creating a fake online persona. Um, the other thing, which again is fun, is celebrity hacking, um, basically relating to hacking the identity of celebrities on Instagram. Um, there are um, there are quite a few examples of that. Um, pr probably one of the most recent is um, Lady Gaga's, I think, um, Madonna or Lady Gaga. Um, uh, Lady Gaga's files were accessed and almost three gigabytes of information related to the singer was posted online after one law firm declined to pay a ransom of nearly 20 million um, US dollars. So this is fun. This shows the skills of the hackers, but it, it's also a money-making machine in a lot of cases. Now, the link between offline and online practices related to corruption um, is sometimes not, um, um, is neither inevitable nor obvious. So sometimes there are historical connections. So for example, there is the practice that we see now happening online used to happen offline in the old days, or sometimes they coexist in the online and offline. For example, the deep fakes um, is, is a practice typically that I typically associated with Compromat, um, which was a practice of creating video, visual material uh, on, um, uh, VIPs in former Soviet Union, um, which was typically done by the former Secret Service. Um, fake news can easily be associated with propaganda. Astroturfing is nothing new. It's a, it's a practice from the 80s. Um, it exists both in online and offline in the political and economic sphere. Sometimes the, the link between online and offline is even more obvious when it comes to actually doing the job. So for example, um, there is research showing that romance scams these days um, happening on Tinder or um, other dating platforms um, actually rely on networks of men from uh, sometimes from North or West Africa that target uh, white women between their uh, mid forties and mid sixties in the um, so-called developed world. Um, and, and they have scripts prepared, they learn, they pass on the knowledge from one another. So these are very well organized um, or um, at least not ad hoc networks of individuals who perform these tasks. Also, um, troll farms. And it's, I, I put here a picture on the right hand side of the, of the screen showing um, research on, this is an article from Financial Times actually, um, talking about Macedonia's fake news industry um, that actually influenced, so basically troll farms that influenced allegedly the US elections, uh, not the latest ones, the previous ones. Um, if you look at those documentaries, for example, about troll farms, you can see there are entire um, villages or small towns in Eastern Europe relying this is just an example, but there, they can also be in the Philippines or other parts of the world, um, in which the local economy relies on people participating in this sort of unethical um, online economy. So this becomes work. Um, I put here the next slide is actually Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal and pact, just to show that um, selling the data of Facebook users um, and this whole scandal actually does show the connections between real people 
and the sell of data. So this is not just something that happens online and is completely detached from the offline world. Right, so what are in the end the common denominators of these practices? Well, as far as I can see, um, these are well-established practice, uh, practices used by actors participating in the online platforms, which are characterized by continuity, um, coherence. So continuity in the sense that um, they, they happen over a long period of time. Um, participants know what they are doing. So there is a, an established way of doing things. They are usually linked to monetization or gaining influence. Um, they are based on deceiving. Um, moral ambiguity in the sense that in a lot of the cases, people do not necessarily um, associate themselves with a label, do not put themselves a label of criminal or deviant. Um, they are intentional. And they happen in, um, in, a, in a sort of environment characterized by legal paucity, which is really a contextual trace, uh, trait that characterizes the online world. So essentially, actors engaging in the performance of these practices form a community of practice. Um, and this community of practice um, operates on platforms that are neither public nor private spheres. I mean, these platforms are essentially private entities, but they also become public entities because of the wide participation and, and the sort of democratization of entering and exiting these platforms. So I think the classical separation between public and private simply does not apply here. Um, online and offline activities, as far as I could see, mutually reinforce each other. Um, there is an easy access to tools for engaging in um, corruption and free access to platforms. So the, the difference, for example, between Compromat as a practice from the former Soviet Union and deep fakes today is that the, everyone has access to deep fake technology. I mean, th there are simple apps that you can just install on your phone and you can produce deep fakes at a really high quality. Um, one of the most important aspects of this community of practice is that geographical borders are not as important as when we practice corruption in the offline world. Um, these communities of practice bypass borders, borders and cultures and essentially create new cultures based on practical competencies um, and pragmatic contribution that one can make to the community. Um, they're very much also linked to everyday lives and activities. And they're formed of very fluid networks of actors whose former identities, I've already mentioned that, are usually not transgressive, even though they may be. But the real question, after speaking so much about these practices, which are clearly deviant practices, but are they really corruption? So that's the bottom line here. Can we really talk about corruption in this sense, in this world, or these are just some forms of fraud or deviance or sometimes organized crime or something else? Well, I have three criteria for that. Um, one of them is the definition of corruption. So we kind of go back to the beginning of, of this talk or presentation. Um, if we use the TI definition, which is the abuse of entrusted power uh, for private gain, all these practices may look like corruption. The problem with that definition is that it's so wide that pretty much anything looks like corruption. So in this sense, I'm not exactly sure if that definition applies. So maybe for the purposes of classification in this sense, maybe we can use corruption um, again as an umbrella term that defines the, the um, borders of this concept and not necessarily um, and, and yeah, tries to actually says what's inside and what's outside. Um, one of the ways in which we need to do that is by relying on public private separation, because that was one of the key traits of, that is one of the key traits of our contemporary understanding of corruption. Um, and like I've said, um, it's not easy to do that online. So probably one way to go around it is to look at the governance of the online world. 
And in doing so, again, I relied a little bit on the UN uh, norms of good governance, which are participation, rule of law, transparency, responsiveness, consensus oriented, equity and inclusiveness, accountability and effectiveness and efficiency. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them because I am reaching the end of my talk, but there are a few things that I would like to say about these uh, norms of good governance. We can see that at least some of them are clearly um, not fulfilled by the practices that I've shown. So for example, transparency is not there, accountability is not there. Um, so not to mention the rule of law. The rule of law, uh, so in this sense, we can say that the practices that I've just discussed here are could be associated with corruption because they don't um, they break the norms of good governance. So let me put it like that. Um, but we can come back to it in the discussion. So um, bottom line, corruption in and via new technologies. Well, um, I think it's actually quite interesting how new technologies, which in my case are uh, the web-based platforms, are actually the perfect environment for the emergence and manifestation of truly transnational corrupt practices. Um, so um, corrupt practices are, for as far as I could see, are not some separate um, action tools, um, but they are integral to the economic and social practices of the offline and online activities. Um, so basically, um, nobody thinks about performing corruption. They're just engaged in, um, I don't know, some economic activity or having some fun or doing the business. Um, actors' motivations for engaging in these practices are clearly multiple. Um, and they can range from political influence to money making to uh, fun. So th they're very heterogeneous. Um, the, what sort of moves these people is the entrepreneurial ethos and innovation um, that is so typical to the platform economy. Um, but again, uh, this is something that I, it's very dear to, to me, and I would like to emphasize it at the end of the talk. Um, the above does not exclude the creative and fun side of corrupt practices engagement. So th the tech skills that, involve, that are involved in um, practicing corruption online give access to a world that is borderless, freer, and in a sense, it's a bit more just because it allows wider participation, a bit more democratic. So what are the implications for the contemporary corruption paradigm? Well, if you think that today we think about corruption either in terms of principal agent or collective or collective action, um, I think from what I can see um, from my work in the online, corruption is really a practical way. It is neither a principal agent nor a collective action problem. It's really a practical way of engaging with the environment. It's really part and parcel of a repertoire of practices learned in most cases informally from others. Um, so this is interesting because then it has implications for policymaking because the anti-corruption agenda in, in this arena of social interaction, um, it could be much more driven by communities of practice and, and their users and much less by the nation states or transnational sort of conventions. Um, and the, the other implication is that measuring corruption at national levels um, with, for example, the, the classical tools that we have now makes very little sense in, in this environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roxana. Um, thank you for challenging us to think about all these new things uh, in new ways. It's all very exciting. Uh, so time for questions and answers. Um, can I ask you if you have a question, please raise your hand using the little reaction button at the bottom of your screen. Or if you don't have one of those, as people sometimes don't, then feel free to just type your name in the chat um, and signal that you'd like to ask a question and we will then come to you. Um, or failing that, if you're shy, you can also type out your whole question in the chat 
and we will also come to you um, for that. Um, so we've got one hand up. I'm just while everyone else is thinking about their questions, um, I'm just going to ask my own. Um, so I really liked the way that you um, you set out all these different kinds of practices, but I was thinking all the way through you know, which of these are fraud and which of these are corruption. And when it came to the end, you you in some ways sidestepped that question, I think, by saying that these are breaking norms of good governance, which is a slightly different question. I, and I just wondered um, if you could say a little bit more about you know, why you decided not to go into using the definitions of corruption that you'd introduced at the beginning, and in particular on that focus, on that aspect of uh, entrusted power. So to what extent in these actions are we seeing abuses of entrusted power? And if you were to try and frame it that way, who's trusting whom to do what, I guess, is, is the question. Um, or you know, if you really don't think that's a useful way of um, looking at it, then it'd be good to hear more about why that is. Um, however, I'm going to suggest we take the questions in groups. So that was mine. And now I'm going to come first to Shahzad and then to Chitu. Uh, to ask theirs, and then I'll come back to you, Roxana. So, Shahzad, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you, Roxana. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I'm sure you've done a lot of uh, research because it sounds very complicated as well. So thank you for, for the presentation. Um, I guess my question is uh, slightly similar to Liz's question, but also generally I was wondering, in terms of yeah, distinguishing where and how corruption actually happens online or offline. I can perhaps imagine cryptocurrency uh, currencies or anything that you mentioned about, for example, child abuse um, and so on, or dating, uh, which I mean, in relation to fraud, some of those can be, um, uh, can be a bit more clear, but I'm not sure, so sure about the corruption in any other sense especially when it comes to transnational and when it comes to organized crime. So I wonder, because they can use online or offline as a tool, but I'm not sure how can you establish corruption actually as a practice took place. So that, that was my kind of question that I was wondering, how, do you, how, how will you address um, the practice of corruption by uh, using online tools. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Shahzad. Uh, and now over to Chitu. Hi, Chitu. Can't hear you yet, Chitu. I think you might be on mute. Actually, I should probably also. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Chitu Okoli. I'm a professor of digitalization at Schema Business School. Uh, I'm uh, actually not so far a corruption researcher, but I am very interested in getting into it. And actually, my um, I'm originally from Nigeria and Canada, so I have hands-on experience growing up. Uh, and I, um, my interest in corruption has actually not been related to digitalization at all. Uh, but uh, I was quite fascinated when I saw your presentation because that uh, brings together my expertise in information systems uh, and then related to corruption, which I want to get into researching. So uh, please excuse me, but I'm uh, going to uh, take this from the eyes of an information systems researcher. So one who my research area is digital platforms and uh, this domain of things. So not, uh, I, I, I'm not embedded in the corruption or political science literature, so I won't come from that angle. Uh, so I, I'm definitely quite excited about your topic and about your interest, uh, as I said. Uh, but my uh, nagging question is the same that uh, I think uh, Liz and Shahzad have mentioned, that I do not really see the corruption in what you have described. Uh, so again, from an information systems research perspective, what you've described are actually very common topics, 
which fall under online fraud. Uh, um, a lot of it is uh, labeled under what we call the dark side of uh, information technology or the dark side of the, in the internet. Uh, so th these are very, almost everything you've mentioned are very popular topics in information systems, but no one would consider them corruption. And I, I don't see the corruption in it at all. Uh, there's only one, I, I was trying to take note of the cases, but the only case that seemed to me to correspond to what I might think of as corruption is with Donald Trump not being able to ban users from his uh, Twitter account uh, because, as you said, the court case there brought in the case that uh, there he is using a private resource but in a public capacity and he can't just uh, decide uh, privately to exclude uh, some populations from this public discourse. So for me, corruption enters in there, but all the other cases. So coming to the beginning with the, I think the definition of corruption is critical. And uh, again, come from an information systems perspective. Um, it, it's, I, I think it would not be really possible to just sidestep a very clear and very carefully scoped definition of corruption. I, I think it's crucial that you clearly scope what you mean by corruption and that whatever you mean by it needs to be very credible. And I don't find credible um, the perspectives that take out the public element. I, I think, it, for me, again, this is really fascinating that there is the private public blurring with these online platforms. I think it's a huge area and I, I really uh, want you to dig into this, but it needs to be clear. And right now I'm, I'm really having trouble seeing the corruption in what you've described. Thank you very much, Chichu. Great. So I suggest we go back to Roxana now and then we'll take a second round of questions uh, in a minute. So do keep thinking of your questions. Roxana. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for making, as in really pointing to the key challenge of my talk, the definition of corruption. So basically, um, let me just answer. Um, I, I, I will refer to your points, but I will give one answer. So um, the need for a clear definition of corruption, you are absolutely right. Um, there is um, th there is this need because we need to conceptually separate what is fraud, what is organized crime, and wh what is corruption, and what are other forms of illegal or deviant behavior. Now, I put what I put in the uh, so uh, Chito, just to say there is corruption in the private sector. I totally understand the need to refer to corruption in especially in relationship to the public sector, but there is uh, quite a bit of literature now documenting the fact that there is corrupting corruption in the private sector. So, and, and the trick with online platforms is this exactly this interplay between um, these online platforms being a public sphere, but also a privately owned sphere, like our own personal data. It's our data, but then it becomes the property of someone else via the terms and condition that we never really read, which basically puts, any, puts us in a different kind of social contract in a way, um, which, more, which is less social and more um, legal. Um, but just to answer, um, this idea of, of um, your question about the, the definition and the boundaries, the conceptual boundaries. Um, one thing that I would say is that a lot of what we would call corrupt practices, um, especially in relationship to online, but also in relationship to offline are um, labeled by the criminal justice system as something else. So if you look at the criminal justice data, indictments or uh, convictions, you can see a lot of um, practices or acts that we would associate to uh, with corruption uh, rebranded as something else simply because of the needs of the criminal justice system, of the prosecutors, it's what they could mm, prove or and that sort of thing. So that happens. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, 
this idea of entrusted power. I think um, when it comes to online, we do give, we as users of the online world, of the online platforms, we do give, we do entrust our power to um, the platforms, but we entrust it. So the, the reason for which I haven't used it is because we entrust the power in very specific conditions. So we always tick a box which says, yes, I've read the terms and conditions and I agree with them. So it's, it might be not knowing, but simply because we don't know what we are doing, it doesn't mean that we are not subjected to that. So that's why I didn't really want to go into this idea of entrusted power. The thing, uh, Liz, what you've just said, who is entrusted, who entrusts and um, who entrusted whom to do what? Um, it's, I mean, it depends really on the practice and on the actual case. Um, but essentially, it's the fact that we think we are doing one thing online and we are giving our data by using some sort of devices or platforms or practices. Um, and then something else is always happening in the background. Now, is this fraud? Is this corruption? Is this organized crime, like in the case of Roman scams? Um, this is where I have the challenge of conceptually separating things. And to be very honest with you, I don't think that the definition, the current definitions are very useful for me. So that's why I sort of bypass this by looking at practices and making a collection of practice. I see that it doesn't work properly, but it's work in progress, so. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so we have another group of questions. Um, first up was Liliana. Hi, uh, hi uh, thank you very much, Roxana, for the talk. It's, uh, it's very, very interesting. And, you know, we hear about these things, we read about them, but then when you kind of see them in a more structured way, you realize the scope of the problem. Um, similar to what was said uh, so far, I was also wondering about the connections with the definition and how do we establish uh, whether something is corruption or not. I was wondering whether you um, whether you uh, looked or considered looking at uh, the types of actors involved, and then maybe use that in order to to be able to kind of mm -hmm. not necessarily define, but pinpoint which of these activities may be actual corruption and which of them may be just uh, illegal behavior or even legal behavior. I know you mentioned catfishing but not even all catfishing is illegal. I mean, there is a TV show where we can, yeah. where they're actually trying to uncover cat the people that have pretended to be somebody else. So it's not even illegal. So maybe if we kind of, I just wanted to know whether you've considered, for example, looking at, okay, we have private individuals as actors, then we have uh, public officials or um, institutions, you know, depending on uh, well, how you want to frame it. Or, and then we have companies with entrusted power and then to see who of this has an actual entrusted power before starting to even to, to consider whether this is corruption or not. So maybe a little bit more on that and whether you've considered it. But thank you very much. Like it's all very new, very interesting and a lot of information provided here today. Great, thank you, Liliana. Uh, Sam, over to you. Hi, Roxana, thanks very much. Um, for that yeah really interesting just to echo what everyone else said um i've got two questions which is a bit naughty i suppose um but one of them is very uh, or ki kind of covered by rob what robert and michael are asking in the um in the chat and it's actually just a very broad question which is you've you've done this fantastic introduction to the way that you're thinking about these things and trying to conceptualize them and i was just interested in the kinds of research questions that you were um wanting to ask with this kind of where you're going to push this forward um, and the sort of, yeah, the, the sort of defined pieces of, of, of research and the specific questions that you think are important in this area. And then the second question I had, um, which is not related to what um, Robert and Michael wrote in the chat, was about your conceptualizations, and particularly, and I suspect this is a problem with my, um, with my comprehension, because I can be a little bit dense with these things, but I just wanted you to, to talk a little bit more about your conceptualization of fun, because I wasn't I wasn't quite sure about how that worked. Are you talking about the people that are committing these acts as having fun and how 
how do you define them as having fun, whereas the actors that commit the other acts aren't having fun? Um, or is it the practices that they engage in are fun? Um, because I couldn't see how those were particularly fun activities, you know, like getting your stuff stolen and leaked onto the internet. Um, but again, as I, as I suggest, uh, I think that was a problem with my, um, with, with my comprehension. So I was just hoping for a little bit of clarification there. Thank you, Sam. Okay, and I'm going to read out the questions in the chat. So Robert Barrington is asking, under the umbrella tech and corruption, one might also cover a the extent to which tech enables corruption in a more traditional sense to that which you have analysed, and b the extent to which tech assists in defending against or actively tackling corruption in new ways. To what extent do you feel these other areas are a substantive part of this subject? Or do you feel the parameters you are drawing represent the key area for research? And then Mike Levy has asked, to complement Robert's question, what do we know about the ways in which social media facilitate the recruitment of corrupt public and private actors? So good meaty set of questions for you there. We'll go back to Roxana now, and then we probably should have time for another round. So do keep the questions coming. Um, awesome. Thank you very much. Liliana, um, you are absolutely right. So I am looking at the types of actors uh, that uh, operate in the online. So may them be public, private, collective actors in a way. Um, so I am looking at that. I just didn't get to the point of um, classifying them meaningfully. So I, I feel that I sort of need to go a, a bit more in depth in terms of ethnographic work to be able to do that. Um, so I, I think that's important. So um, I think practices is just one part of it. Actors are the second and the networks and the, the, the way they interact, the relational aspect of it is the third one in this model that I'm creating. So I essentially presented one third of it now, um, but you are absolutely right. I'm going into that. Uh, Sam, your point, fun. <laughs> uh, that's a very interesting question. So. Um, I come from a tradition of work, um, sociological work essentially, that looks as de at deviance, not only as work or a compulsion because of the social structures of the society, but also as fun. So when people commit deviant acts, they do it because they enjoy doing that. So the hooligans going to the, the, the games, the football games, they destroy things because it's fun, because it's part of the game, because they wanna do it. It's the same when it comes to online fun. It's just that it's more accessible. Hackers, a lot of hackers are just kids, literally kids uh, who in the back room of their parents, in the bedroom of their parents, they do something. And sometimes they engage in organized crime. A lot, there is a lot of literature about organized crime saying that people engage in it because it's part of traditional masculinity, because it's easy money, because they just wanna do it. Sometimes it's work. You know, it's hardcore work. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's it's a fusion of the two in which you can't really separate. So this is what I mean by that. You know, so so it's not it, it's not clear cut. It's not so th just because it's fun. It doesn't mean you you don't make money out of it. So it's it's a it's a sort of culture that is based on you know leisure and enjoying and you know taking things easy. You know, um, and in terms of research questions. Again, that's a very interesting point that you are making there. Um, so my key research question is a what question. What does corruption in the online look like? That's my question. So I basically, my aim is to describe it. It's to put my finger on it and create boundaries, essentially separate it. I don't care about the why. I don't care about why it exists. I don't even care about how it's manifested. I have to talk, but in trying to answer the what, I have to tackle the how, because I, I don't see any other way of going around it. So that's, that, that's the only way I know to go about it. So I don't know if that's a, a satisfying answer. Going to Robert and Mike. Uh, Robert, you are spot on. So I completely excluded the second part of the question B, which means um, the extent to which tech assists, assists in defending against corruption. I do not look at that on purpose because that's a, a special talk about anti-corruption and how tech 
helps or not anti-corruption agenda because we seem to live we, we seem to grow on this idea that tech essential which equals in our minds e-governance is by default going to reduce corruption and that's not the case there is quite a bit of literature around the world showing that technology doesn't really tackle corruption but you are right this is not the purpose of my talk i will try to include it now mike i'm not sure i understand your question this is so interesting so what you, you mean like what do we know about the ways in which social media facilitates the recruitment of corrupt public and private actors? Do you mean like how social media um, manages to offer more opportunities to actors that are already corrupt? So essentially make the world their oyster or do you mean make more people corrupt or how do you mean? Mike, can That's we ask you to put in an appearance? Uh, since I'm not shy. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, what I meant was, um, does it make it easier for um, people to get in touch with people who are already corrupt? Because um, if you think about the, uh, the traditional constraints on uh, corruption, one of them is, yeah, how do you trust uh, uh, mm -hmm. people around you? Um, now, tech might involve issues about trusting strangers, um, and therefore, it's an open question, really, whether uh, whether it leads to more corruption or not. Because if you're worried about uh, strangers, you might it might not increase the total volume of corruption. So thank you. So you actually mean giving access and entering transactions with corrupt officials via tech. So you actually think yeah. about tech as a facilitator of corrupt transaction in very classical terms. Well, it's an open question whether it does or not. Um, you're the researcher in this. Case. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. I just wanted to understand what you were saying. You didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, so that, that's, a, that's very interesting. I have, the, the honest answer is I have no idea, but when it comes to establishing trust online, um, there is research about that. I mean, um, there is research looking at how, you know, following Gambetta's work about how do people establish trust with taxi drivers. There is research from Imperial looking at how do people establish trust on Uber platforms, for example, and because you are entering um, transactions with unknown people. And um, there are established ways of setting up trust, of signaling trust online. And that is especially on Airbnb, for example, or booking, that is reviews, may them be fake or true. Um, that is, uh, you know, checking location on Tinder or stuff like that. So there are almost, so trust in the online is not accidental, it's institutionalized. So it, it, as in, 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 a, in, in the sense of rulemaking institutionalized, that, that's what I mean by that. So, so I, I don't know if in this sense, technology facilitates corruption, um, but, but I, think it's a, I think when it comes to trust, there are cues of whom and how much you can trust. Also, I think the other thing about the online, about technology, is the fact that it gives access to professionals in hacking. So if you really want to get in touch with someone that you think is corrupt, uh, you get a professional who is going to hack his or her account. And that basically gives you a lot of cues about whether or not to trust that person or to blackmail that person. But then we enter a different domain. Um, but I will, I will keep this as, a, as an open question for myself um, when, I, when I do the... Um, when I look at the actors and relational, how, how um, corruption is relational. So thank you. Great, okay. Oh, sorry, do you want to come back, Mike? Yes, yeah, sorry. I don't think Odebrecht has a, um, an, on, uh, an online website uh, asking for customer satisfaction. So it might depend on the context. Yes, that's also true. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm just going to read out a couple of comments from the chat and then I'm going to come to Serena to ask her question. So Eureka has said, in her view, individual cases of activities are done with deception, 
which puts them in the fraud category. Mm. Um, however, the company or platform who don't challenge against fraudulent activity, in that case, it's corruption. Um, and then um, Becky is saying, if I understand correctly, the practices element of your theory is related to gains or motivation, the gains being influence, information, money or fun. And this is an area that really needs better elaboration in all contexts and so could provide really useful insights more broadly. Also, the entrusted power question is challenging here, but it's a problem that is present offline in new governance frameworks and not at all resolved. So thinking about the possible, possible meaning of or scope of entrusted power in these new tech contexts, whether or if it exists, could lead to broader insights. Very interesting. Uh, thank you for those. Sorina, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. So thank you very much for the subject. I find it extremely interesting. It's actually answering some of the questions that I had. I come from the social um, part of things, so civic society. Um, and I would say that from a definitions perspective, what I wrote down um, would be probably interesting to not just stop at defining corruption, but also define the four elements that um, are generally accepted as being part of corruption. So what does abuse mean? What does, you know, um, financial gain or reputational gain? Or what does deliberate um, mean in this context? Um, so that would be my first thing. Um, from a user's perspective, just coming from what you've um, explained earlier, I would also look at the drain that happened on social media following the Cambridge Analytica and also following um, the scandal with Donald Trump last year and the fact that actually users do click that accept terming, term and condition when joining some networks but um, lately users have become much more savvy and much more aware of whether or not they want to join a specific network or not with all the advantages or disadvantages that that means that the that decision brings so i would i would look at that um and then you mentioned you you were looking at the what and you you needed to define the how for some reason i think that it would be much more interesting to look at the five pressing questions and i would add the who the why and the when because context in online um has a huge impact and there are, from my experience, especially for civic society things, there are times where you just see a disturbance in the, in the force appearing and all of a sudden it pops up in one place and then it just pops up every single place you look. So the when and the how go together here, but it also brings the who is the target of that particular action information or platform or transaction however you want to define it so yeah those would be my points thank you excellent thank you very much uh, so um we are technically out of time but i'm going to ask anyone who can to stay on for another um five ten minutes and um if you need to go that's fine roxana over to you um, thank you very much um, for for the comments. Um, I so Yuriko, Becky, I totally take your points. So yeah, I understand uh, what you are saying, Yuriko, about deception and and um, corruption. So basically, when you are switching the actor, when you are changing the actor, the the it's almost like the definition changes, and you are attaching a different label in terms of practices. So I think that's very smart. Thank you very much for this suggestion, Becky absolutely right i think um i think it can open um this to um i mean just looking at the abuse of entrusted power for private gain can definitely open up um, a broader conversation about what corruption is um sorina your point about going into each of the key points of the definition is that, that's spot on i plan to do that i just shied away right now from this definition i i yeah, I was not convinced that was the best way, but maybe I should do that. Um, and and yes, absolutely. The, the last point that you've made about the context is um, key in this sense, because 
um, I put together under uh, this umbrella of corruption, um, a huge um, variety of practices that happen all over the world in all sorts of contexts, in all sorts of on all sorts of platforms. So it's actually very hard to, 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 to establish boundaries here. So I totally, your point about the context is essential. Online is not enough. It has to be way more specific than that. Um, I think I was just being a little bit too ambitious to, to generalize and create a, essentially a conceptual framework for this. Great, so thank you very much. Um, big thank you to Roxana for taking us off on this exploration of a really new area, which I think is really exciting um, to go and, and think about and have all these new questions opened up. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Great to see current students, past students here, as well as lots of um, colleagues in the field. So um, a really good discussion. Thanks everybody, see you next time. Thank you, bye.